Let's get busy. Kevin Hale up in this house, my home away from home. It's Baxter's 942 in the Highlands where I do my shooting from the lip podcast recording. Uh, Tuesday nights they have the 1940 Tuesdays where they promote uh, a tequila. Are you familiar with that tequila? Drink? I, I am not. I'm not. It sounds delicious yeah, though. Kind of. It's a, like a typically it's like a twenty five dollar sh- a shot, twenty five per shot, and their special is six bucks. And there's uh, some other specials that they do tonight. Nice. Um, I've been doing the podcast on Tuesday nights since March of two thousand eighteen. And, again, my home away from home. So, continuing on this Tuesday night, I get to bring in a new buddy of mine. Hola. How are you, Cam? What's up? Doing well. Um, I've kind of, you know, um, known of you because of Local Arts Review, and we're going to get into that, too. And then uh, through uh, my daytime experience, you and I have been able to connect. Sure. I'll leave it at that. But, um, sure. Uh, so far, so good with yeah. us. I like uh, our, we have good conversations. Too. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, so much amazing things, you know, to uh, to kind of think about. And uh, that's one of the things that I really love is the conversation starters, mm. the the nougat of an idea to be able to start a conversation. And uh, that's where I come, you know, with so much of my marketing experience is relational mm-hmm. and, and being able to promote somebody's product because they have a direct relationship with their customers right you know through the podcast what i've been able to um, uh, pleasantly come across is a lot of talent in town yeah a lot a whole bunch from in this case from the arts you know uh, film industry uh, musicians a lot of people Um, fine artists yeah professors Teachers, education, right? Lawyers, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. healthcare, uh, a lot yeah. of healthcare in town. Everything. Um, as far as entertainment goes, I've told this to a lot of people, and I'll I'll, I'll stand by it. Um, I don't think I really need to get out of Louisville to be entertained. Sure. And when it comes to music, food, beverage, arts, again, uh, it's all here. Sure. There's almost too much. Uh, <coughs> Do you think really? N- in a good way, though, okay. only because, you know, my thought on Louisville is that Louisville is a city of neighborhoods, yeah. right? So each neighborhood is kind of That's unto itself. Mm-hmm. And so they have the people that live in the neighborhood and the people that respect the history or the ideas behind the neighborhood to allow these art and artist musicians right. to coexist and, and live and create art. The... The, the problem, and it's a good problem to have, I think, for Louisville is that, you know, we're, we're on the river. We're, we're a river city, and so Louisville exists because of the falls of the Ohio. That's a good point. 37 feet is what the river drops in Louisville. Yeah. So people would come down, offload their barges, store them. That's why you had so much storage downtown, mm. bourbon trade, stuff like that. A little history lesson here. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, you know, I think Louisville's very open to that. Mm-hmm. The, the problem, and I work with a lot of artists under, through or the Louisville Arts Review, and the, the thing is, is that you have to be raised or come to Louisville, absorb the vibe, but then you have to leave to actually cut your teeth. And it's really hard to be an independent artist based out of Louisville. Mm-hmm. So many people are from <coughs> Louisville. It's because of the opportunities. We, we lack opportunities. I, I think so. I think so. And, and that's going to be one of the things that, you know, Louisville will have to continue to work on right. is that there's never that I think of, and I'm just a voice of, of millions, you know, but there's a, there's a brain drain in Louisville where you're not going to be able to attract and keep different tech companies, um, there's never going to be an Amazon or a Facebook mm-hmm. HQ right. in Louisville. Right. And it's not because Louisville's not deserving or worthy. It's because we don't necessarily have the retail stratosphere that people who make a half million, a million, $20 million a year yeah. would feel comfortable 
spending. Mm -hmm. So there's a brain drain and you have super talented people that are from Louisville or are in Louisville for very short periods of time and then they bounce and they go to a California, Silicon Valley, yeah. Chicago, New York. Nashville, music was Nashville, yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, and those are those are very good points. And and in fairness, got to give a little bit of love to the Southern Indiana. You mentioned the Ohio, but you know, with Southern Indiana, Jeffersonville, New Albany, they're growing oh, over there, big time. And you know, there's uh, that that helps. Mm -hmm. I mean, it not only like I know from a musician standpoint, uh, musicians here in town have now. Uh, you know, some additional venues to go across mm -hmm. the just you know, close sure. to 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 play and um, sure. And I think you're going to see more intermingling mm -hmm. as um, Jeff and New Albany kind of round out their downtown experience. Yeah, and that you're going to see more people being able to play regularly right. and get paid and get paid because yeah. that's the, that's always the catch. Yeah. Everybody mm -hmm. wants to trade for exposure. Mm -hmm. Exposure don't pay the bills. No. No, not no, not especially when you know, I got a lot of friends who are musicians. That's your full time gig. Yeah, and um, so I get it. Yeah. Uh, well, if they're not touring, then they're probably doing some sort of studio work or songwriting mm -hmm. and being able to trying to create. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and that's the ultimate goal is always to to create. Right. Yeah. Um, give me a little history. What's what is your background? I know you're you kind of a. Uh, incognito on social media <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, but I, I, uh, what can you tell me about you well i uh i started out loving graphic design and i got my first logo job when i was like eight or nine years old no shit and it was my mom's uh, uh lexington road preservation thing and they so you've lived in logo. Lobo all your life i have okay i have yeah um i was born in dallas um because my dad was on a job there and then we moved back to Louisville when I was like 18 months old that's probably when the Cowboys didn't suck <laughs> they had a good game so Sunday but anyways yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not much of a sports ball guy okay, fair, but fair. Uh, the the coach what was the coach the famous coach and he always had the trilby Tom Landry yes yeah, yeah. so uh, yeah we moved back here but my uh, my grandfather has had a liquor store in Delhi for a long time mm. that he sold to the Morrises and uh, so yeah our, our Louisville roots are it would be great for for a long time. Yeah, as my uh, grandfather used to say, people need to eat every day. Yeah, they need to. That's a good good point. Very good point. Um, so, Louisville Arts Review uh, mission statement to shine a light on the arts and artists of the River City. Uh, it was created by individuals who love local arts culture of Louisville. Uh, we work to shine a light streaming out of the river city elaborate who who's who's the go-to's who are you targeting here we started it in december of 2009 mm -hmm. and i had just moved back I, I lived in the mountains of north carolina for eight years mm -hmm. and started my own business doing marketing design graphic design logos and i loved it working for yourself is is a, a wonderful nightmare <laughs> you know and yeah. i jokingly say that a beautiful disaster <laughs> i jokingly say you know it's your fault when things go right and it's your fault when things go wrong right. yeah. damned if you do right and and so i was working with small business owners and uh you know over the years i've interacted with you know hundreds of business owners and uh we started it because there was a vacuum mm -hmm. there was nobody um going to shows, going to openings, and then writing a piece in review. Everything was just promoting, promoting, promoting. So that's where we filled the vacuum. And, and thankfully, nobody was doing it at the time. So we had a crew of about five or six, and we had people that would go to, to openings and shows, and they would write a 500-piece or 600-piece article. We'd print it all up and pass them out for free. Okay. It's a terrible, terrible business model. Because, well, but you you do the the advertising, you know, to to, to make income or things. no, not in the beginning, okay. and and we were able to leverage a little bit of advertising, um, but m most people, most places, unless they're art centric or the owners are 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 artists or support the arts, they're they're not going to to pay for a small periodical that comes out monthly. Mm -hmm. But we did it anyway. 
And so we got 17 issues under our belt. And by that time, we'd seen an explosion in different zines and stuff that were coming back in art artists. So we were proud to be able to kind of help kind of re-kickstart that fifth wave, mm -hmm. sixth wave, however mm -hmm. many waves. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and lasted, like I said, 17 issues. And then we pivoted, and we were only online, but we had a website, and somebody was having to update what, what that. What time frame is this? So 2009, two, we probably quit to early 2012. Okay. If I'm, I, my math might be All wrong. Right. So from 2012 to probably 2015, okay. we kept up a blog and we kept up stuff like that. Right. We just weren't the cost of printing. Got it. And it was totally self-funded by myself. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was a barista, you know, so I was spending a couple hundred dollars a, a month getting these dang things printed. I feel you and passed out mm -hmm. so you you do it for the love of the game mm -hmm. and after 2015 i was like this website thing is just a drag and updating it so then we just went and it was me at that point because everybody else had other jobs or moved away or something and i just went social so since 2015 we've pretty much only been facebook and twitter yeah I mean, and we've is, got a lot of eyeballs yeah and you still do uh, free the free uh, free source uh, uh, free media and it's you know that's something you know even with my my podcast i've been doing this i've been podcasting over five years shooting from the lip is going on five years i don't have a website sure and you know i got a lot of friends who uh podcast and they you know it's one of the first things they do is get the website going and you know that expense and i'm like Nah, not yet. I, I mean, uh, if you get to a point where you have to, because look, if you're doing something like a podcast or you're doing views or video content, you can't afford the bandwidth. Right. So you would offshore it to Vimeo or YouTube or Stitcher or mm -hmm. something like that, right. because they're the ones who are actually going to be holding the bag when mm -hmm. it comes to streams. Right. Websites, I, they're important for some places. Right. I would say my nickel's worth of advice would be if you're a business and you're debating whether or not you should do a website, go get certified and be a Google person and get your Google page squared away and yeah. your hours right. And between Google and Facebook. Right. There are those two yeah. things right there. I those think those two that free that, services. <laughs> the average consumer doesn't think about it like that. Right. And this small business owner, because, you know, there's a million other decisions. So, I, but I think that's that's a something think, you that know, you could yeah, do that, that, that just really leverages yeah. what your hours are. The, 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 the novice person, when it comes to the Internet, looks at Facebook, looks at Google as a website, you know. Sure. So, you know, that's how when I give, if they want video contact content, I give them uh, my Facebook Shooting from the Facebook page. They yeah. want audio, then I give them a Spotify page. Yeah. You know? So, and it's. Yeah. And, and, and I think that that's a very easy fix mm -hmm. for people. And it just takes takes a weekend. Right. For the average person, it takes a weekend. What you and I could do in about an hour right. might take a weekend. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you want to if you want to move up and get branded Gmail and Gmail backends and your, you know, your custom stuff, there's, there's a cost to that. Right. But that's just part of what it costs to do business yeah. if you're going to be selling a product. Exactly. So, you also have some family. And I, I don't know, I'm, we won't say. I don't, it's up to you to say who they are. Uh, that's in. That uh, does a lot of promoting of their work on social media as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Actually, both my yeah, brothers. Bro, share with them because they they do both do some cool things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm so proud of them. Yeah. They, they've done some very cool, amazing you me, stuff. Yeah. So uh, there's three of us. Mm -hmm. I'm the oldest, eldest, depending on your nomenclature. Uh, my, my younger brother, Corey, is owner and founder of Natus Films. Mm -hmm. N-A-D-U-S. Yes. N-A-D-U-S yeah. Films right. dot com. And, they're, and it's, that's backwards. That's, it's Sudan yeah. backwards, right. right, which was the, um, the first focus of when he realized what he wanted his creative energy to go towards. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he, he started off doing wedding photography. So he got comfortable with the production side of, of doing a mm -hmm. large event and then was able to go and, and to Sudan 
quite a few times over the course of a couple of years and film a documentary mm-hmm. about their transition. Well, it's now been a couple of transitions from war to peace. Right. So he, he did that and film. What's, what's the time? I'm curious. The time frame why he was doing this. Over. He was doing that. Uh, we were promoting it to uh, fests worldwide in probably 2005 because mm-hmm. I was in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. So he probably went like <coughs> 2000 to 2004, mm-hmm. 203, or 2001 to 2005. So he, he did. He started out with the documentary um, and then got funding and created a second film on Southern Sudan, um, which is a, it is a combination of, it's a, uh, I forget what the technical term is, but it's like a, a, a fictional narrative mm-hmm. where it's many different people's stories worked through these characters uh, on screen. And there's a lot of animation in it and a lot of other stuff. So um, that did well. He had a great opening. And then he found that he really liked these these stories that maybe weren't being told. And he's since been to Guatemala, India. Um, There's a lot out there. <laughs> the, a whole lot. Um, the one that you would really like being a sports guy is his work with uh, Chris Long, Chris Long yeah. of uh, Water Boys. Yeah, got to show him through that. Yeah. Which was badass. Yeah, so check out the video um, where Chris Long and, and uh, um, the I forget his official tile, title, but the guy in the uh, U.S. government uh, person for Tanzania mm-hmm. is Brad Pitt's brother, Oh, yeah. Doug, okay. Doug Pitt. And so Corey went over there with his team and filmed it and uh, just doing fabulous work. Yeah. Then they also hiked to the top of Kilimanjaro over the course of eight days, filmed it. And then there was a very short window, but he was one of the first or if not the first person to jump off the true summit of Kilimanjaro and they hang glided down so like he and a guy were like bunched with the parachute and they had to run run like hell yeah. off this thing and then it inflates and yeah the footage is pretty unreal Good God. so he's one of those thrill seekers no man yeah, yeah. oh yeah he's, he's always looking for the story the more adventurous the better the better mm-hmm. yeah. and he filmed it did he did Oh, yeah, he's got a whole team. Oh, yeah, man, they've got great sponsorships, yeah. and it's a real deal. I mean, they've they've gone all over the world now, but they also do local stuff. Right. So he's, he, he's still local. Oh, yeah, still yeah. in Louisville. Yeah. Yeah, they're down by uh, Grind okay. on uh, Market. Okay. Grind Burger. Yeah. Natus, right? Natusfilms.com. Natus Films. Okay. And you have another brother who does... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my youngest brother, Tyler, uh, man... His, his his story was he actually there's a Leo article about yeah. him and he made the cover uh, the back in 2012 story. I think uh, so that, the short he's that's at rags to riches so. yeah <laughs> so you know he was working for a, a local company doing graphic design and he loves the graphic design aspect of it but he wanted to be able to strike out on his own mm-hmm. so he started his own company and he was getting his own clients but he found himself kind of there's a little bit of a dry spell. Mm-hmm. So he started recreating a uh, deck of playing cards. Fast forward to Kickstarter. He wanted $6,250 over 30 days. 30 days later, after the internet fell in love, he made 146520 It's almost 150 grand. Yeah. Good yeah, four times. And so, uh, yeah, people loved him and all the other stuff that... Uh, that yeah, because I mean it was unreal. He I think he made his goal in like forty eight hours. His, his work is amazing. It's, and, it's very creative. Yeah, very creative. Yeah, and so he was able to take that. He was working under another name. He was able to take that money after he did all of his fulfillment and everything, and start a company called Miscellaneous Goods mm. Company Co. Miscellaneous Goods Co. That's about as generic. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. like uh, the coyote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And he's, uh, man, so he's doing a lot of um, products that people are buying. Yeah. And some of it is, you know, like variant cards. So he's released different types of cards. Um, those are printed up in Cincinnati at the Bicycle Trading Card Company. Mm-hmm. And, uh, man, he's just really able to to bring. He's done a ceramic flask. Um, 
one of the other things, I, I'm not sure, he might have kickstarted this too, but he created a ceramic ice container where you could do a manual brew or pour over coffee, put it through the thing with the ice mm -hmm. that takes it from 210 down to 48 degrees in a couple of minutes. Yeah. So you get iced coffee without watering it down or yeah. cutting it with ice cubes and stuff like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. So he's got a lot of great stuff like that. So yeah, miscellaneous goods co Google them because there's yeah. hyphens and stuff in there. We'll make sure, uh, I want to get those links and I'll add it to the, um, to the post I do. Sure. Um, what other, what other project you, you working on? Ah, well, we, uh, I just was talking to a photographer here in town and it looks like we're going to be doing a really cool, uh, year, year or two year long photography project. Mm. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna get together in the winter and kind of start taking that cause we have to hit all four seasons, yeah. um, at multiple places around town. So I'm, I'm excited. I think Speaking that'll be pretty seasons, cool. Technically, we're into fall, but it, you know, it, the heat index was over 100 degrees today. Yeah, it was hot. <laughs> yeah, it's very it hot. Still is. I think it's actually supposed to be in the upper 90s yeah. for in, in a few days. But Dog days of summer. Yeah, I digress. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, that's 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 going to be a, a future project. Um, the the thing is, is that I'm also trying to. You know, my because I'm I'm always having conversations and ideas, and I try to you know write as much stuff down because relate. For me, if it's not written down, it doesn't exist. Yeah. So uh, I've been writing stuff down, and I've been really happy to see the news coming out of Kentucky uh, about their embrace of hemp mm -hmm. and hemp culture. Nice segue. I, I think that that's a huge deal for Kentucky, mm -hmm. and I think that it could replace burly tobacco you know enough as an industry um, because so many things now that we have the technology uh, and binders that are you know a lot safer for the environment that you can start having paper plates and packaging and all this can be made from hemp fiber that allow ultimately biodegrade <coughs> correct me if I'm wrong I mean a lot of people uh, there's, I, I was talking to some people and they didn't realize that hemp how long it's been around mainstream wise oh the first cars right. used hemp right hemp you know, oil hemp oil yeah yeah um yeah so and, and yeah going to this you know i'm kind of piggy, piggybacking off a podcast i did uh, a few weeks ago where senator dan syme and his son dan jr came on and chatted me up on their quest to legalize cannabis here mm -hmm. in the state mm -hmm. uh, full legalization sure. you know, not just medicinal mm -hmm. but as they call it it's not recreational they do not want to refer to that anymore they they call it adult responsible use sure um, I'm an advocate I yeah. support it yeah I didn't jump on the cannabis slash Marijuana. I didn't jump on that until late in my life, sure. like the last few years. But I mentioned on the podcast somebody who uh, periodically deals with rheumatoid arthritis. It has helped. Sure. Pain. Well, I think that, you know, there, like anything else, as the technology gets better, the technology to detect can also get better. Mm -hmm. And I think that they're able to have these <coughs> different types of hemp CBD strains, whether you're talking terpenes or whatever, they're able to extract and mix it into a flavor profile, mm -hmm. much like you would do a mash bill for beer right. or bourbon or so they're able to build that more. So it's not just like this is magic hemp that in 2019 grows differently. Right. Well, sure. But the growing, the understanding of the cycle, the the speed at which hemp grows, that there's just a lot well, of actually, renewable actually, benefits. Actually, I don't know that. Uh, elaborate on that, the speed. What uh, are we talking about there? I believe that, um, and double check my numbers, but I believe that you can get a full grow of hemp fields every three months. No shit. 
So I think that you can ultimately, in, in our weather, I think we're 6B here, um, that you can get two full growth cycles. Nice. Yeah. And places south of us can get year round. And so now there's things that need to be looked at on the genetic side and they can move genetics one way if, and make it more drought tolerant or less water uh, consumption. So there's, there's the ecological balance. You know, everybody can't just grow out and, and grow hemp. Mm-hmm. You have, in Kentucky, especially, you have to have all the permits in place and, and have the, the acreage, the 10,000 acres or whatever, to, to buy into the program and, and actually give it a go. Yeah. But I think that it's real easy for people, especially, especially Kentuckians, to forget that Kentucky was the number one hemp provider in World War II in the nation. You know what for? Here's a little pop quiz. Go. Ropes for the U.S. Navy. Really? Ropes. Wow. The hemp strand, tensile strength, is far higher than cotton. Some synthetics beat it now. Mm-hmm. But it was the strongest material that they could make ropes wow. out of. And so Kentucky grew a lot of the hemp used in the Navy ropes. I mean, it, it's been around for a while. Yeah. And it really wasn't until the early 70s when Nixon started his war on drugs that then created all of this Mm -hmm. terrible things that have happened to Americans, disproportionately so. And, you know, the main people who bore the brunt of this war on drugs are people of color, disproportionately so. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because if there's one thing... uh our good old U.S. is good at is incarcerating young, yes. young black men. Yes, unfortunately <laughs> so. And a lot of that is not a lot, but, well, I mean, the, the numbers don't lie. I mean, Well, the data suggests that consumption rate is the same yeah. between white and black mm-hmm. consumers. Yeah. And there's a three-to-one incarceration rate to that. And that's, that's not right, mm-hmm. you know. But I think, that, I think that Kentucky definitely has some... Uh, hurdles to come over um i think that you know you know mccollum embracing hemp we're able to move it along at the federal level all that's good Mm -hmm. the problem for i think kentucky is going to ultimately wind up with whatever legalization they go for as far as cannabis goes that they're going to have to recognize that you can't grow hemp and cannabis in the same field you mentioned that earlier and why in why is that well, because you can't grow hemp and cannabis next to each other. A, they're, they're cousins, yeah. right? Genetically, they're cousins. Same as with hops. Gotcha. So hops, cannabis, and hemp are all cousinish. Speaking of, real quick. Chions, chions, chions. So Kentucky's got this unfortunate road ahead of it where it's going to need to figure out what the exclusion zones are for their hemp and cannabis cultivation mm-hmm. because you can't put them next to each other. Five-ish miles, I think, is the minimum. Three to five miles, wow. I think, is the minimum. So does that mean that you have wet and dry counties again? Oh, that's a good, yeah. With, wow. with cannabis you. Culti- cultivation, you. you know? Wow. Or are you talking about... <coughs> You have to, uh, every, every grow operator who applies for a license also has to buy $50,000 in HEPA certified filtration so that you know that the, whatever spores, are you only buying and and planting feminized plants? You know what I mean? There's a lot of things that they can do, but as Jurassic Park taught us, life always finds a way. So you have these exclusion zones of between five and 15 miles, I think is probably going to be your, your good average, but spores can cross pollinate up to 30 miles away. Um, but there's a lot of things that, that, uh, that farmers can do to limit that cross pollinization and, you know, growing taller hedge crops and, and alternating rows with something that grows taller, um, that would theoretically block some of the cross pollinization but it'll be interesting to see how they're able to kind of navigate that because i don't know of any other state that's putting so much weight behind hemp 
And so for Kentuckians, you know, the question is going to be, will they be able to coexist? Right. Now, no, where, where are we at? At least 10, 10 to 12 states that are um, where cannabis is fully legal. Sure. Um, I think you've got a handful or whatever. I think you've got 26 total that are yeah. medical, medical and, right. and yeah, 10 or 12. But see, some of them have it on the books, <laughs> mm-hmm. but they don't have any plan in place. Yeah. So it's it's it's. Well, this is what blows blows me away, and, and I ask this with them these guys too, the some guys, is that the states that are, you know, Colorado, Washington, state, California, you know, they they they've been legal for several years. Yeah, as, as they say, numbers don't lie. Sure. I mean the 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 the. Uh, the amount of money that it's bringing in. Oh, it's huge. It's, yeah. Huge billions. I, I, Colorado I, had like a billion dollar after yeah. two or three, three something years. Three, yeah, three, four, yeah. And, cool. you know, I mean, they're, they're taking some and going to schools and, and homeless addiction and homeless right. housing and stuff. Which is what it should be. I'm yeah. 100% behind that. Mm. You know, I think that for Kentucky, they're going to need to also ask the, the difficult question of, uh, vertical or horizontal integration. Mm-hmm. So states like California have a vertically integrated cannabis culture. Right. So that means the people that grow it also have to prune it, cure it, right. package it, weigh it, deliver it, soup sell it, soup to nuts. Yeah. The horizontal integration would be more of an Oregon where the growers grow Cultivate, yeah. Everybody passes it, you know, and, and it gets moved and taxed probably at every at every touch point. In, in fairness, isn't that for for businesses for you know just getting more people involved? Isn't that the way to do it? You know, there's there's good arguments on both sides. <coughs> um, ultimately, the hinge point is quality control, mm. because how how do you guarantee that your product is going to go from earth? to cure and yeah. from cure to packaging and then from packaging out the door there's a lot of oversight because you because you know that's true a lot there's with those moving parts become hands and other ideas and because yeah. because the the object is always zero diversion right mm-hmm. but in in the states where you have horizontal it's a little bit harder um oregon and, and colorado are two interesting use cases Mm -hmm. because Colorado was very diligent and they were very measured in how many permits they allowed for growers and, and um, shops to be able to sell. Oregon was a little different in the fact that anybody who applied, assuming there was a vetting process, they essentially got a permit because From what I understand, Oregon was concerned about all the black market flowing out. And so they were trying to bring everybody into the daylight, which is, that's a good measured response as well. Mm -hmm. But what has happened in Oregon is that you have a glut. So you suddenly have a million pounds of marijuana that cannabis consumers are not consuming. So it's pushing the price down. Mm -hmm. So then you're looking you're literally right, yeah. at four or five dollars a gram yeah. in Oregon versus yeah. or uh, 28 grams yeah. is going to be 80 or 100 dollars, yeah. whereas in Colorado it might be 80 or uh, 28 grams for 150 yeah, or right. 200 dollars mm-hmm. if it's top shelf, whatever, you know. Yeah. And, and I'm assuming you're you're versed enough to know these <laughs> there's there's wisdom that comes from experience. Exactly. Always. With everything. Yes. With everything. Um, you know, one thing I've noticed, too, and I, to me, I just don't think it's a good thing. All these CBD shops, you know, are popping up like freaking Starbucks. Sure. I mean. You know what they're doing, though? Go ahead. Carving out real estate. It's just a waiting game. Mm. They're carving out real estate. 70% of the CBD shops would change overnight into a dispensary if they could. Mm-hmm. And so they're just carving out their little, what they think is their part of the empire. 
it's, it's, it's a, a waiting game. It's a war of attrition. Mm-hmm. And the question is, is Indiana or Tennessee or West Virginia or Ohio's already fallen? Who's going to fall first? Right. Right. Buckle of the Bible Belt, irregardless of state lines, who's going to ultimately cave? Mm-hmm. And I, you know, I, I think that from the pundits' chair, I think Indiana is going to fall first, mm-hmm. and 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 it's almost because you see the pendulum swing so fast. And in Indiana, they're extremely harsh on any type of possession laws, yeah. extremely harsh. Yeah. So it's almost like. If it were to become legal, they just shrug their shoulders and say, well, we're not going to go after that anymore. The question for Kentucky is, is Tennessee going to do it before? Because if you read books like uh, Cornbread Mafia, you know, and, and you understand that the, the amount of people that it takes to put multi-state grow operations into, Kentucky's going to still keep doing what it does but the question is, is how are they then going to get it out if the surrounding states are all doing right. it themselves? It themselves yeah. That's a good point. Um, you know, uh, when, it came, when it comes to, and I'll, I'll, I'll use this example, me as an example. Growing up, uh, I grew up in a Southern Baptist home yeah. where alcohol, smoking, sure. definitely drugs. Sure. Poo-poo. Uh, rock music. Right. It's the devil's brand. I mean, it's there were no nos. Oh yeah. And um, so then I guess growing up, I always tied, you know, when it came to marijuana, cannabis, that it was, you know, it was the that conservative group that were against it, and um, Christians and all that was it was against it. Is that that still the case, or is that? I mean, what's your thought on that? Uh, no, No. I don't think it is. Um, I think that the way the way that the argument was framed in 1973 was ultimately a racist argument against marijuana and cannabis. So the Nixon administration, and, and, and this is all conjecture, but the Nixon administration essentially was really sick and tired of the anti-war activists and the hippies, mm-hmm. right? So, how do you hit them where where they where where they'll they'll get in line? And it was you know prosecuting you know marijuana, mm-hmm. and and suddenly you got all these hippies that are running scared because they don't want to be prosecuted for marijuana. There's these draconian laws and all this, and so they were essentially trying to break up these anti-war activist groups by going after Mm -hmm. marijuana you know one thing you know growing up too but they also used it as as a you don't want your white daughters to be influenced by these dark jazz musicians or these mexican laborers who have used marijuana and cannabis for years so yeah it was it was a stale argument but what one of my arguments you know or i i have this debate or conversation with you know growing up you'd hear marijuana cocaine heroin all bad for you sure well Uh, remember too this was also the reagan years yeah so you've got nancy reagan's frying pan with the eggs there you go all that so you know and then kids teenagers started to try marijuana and then they were like it's not so bad. Right. You lied to us. Sure. People lied to us. What else are you lying about? Sure. Uh, maybe heroin is not as bad as right. you say. Maybe co- cocaine is not as bad. My thing here, where I'm going with this is that don't play the, the fucking uh, card that marijuana is bad for you or anything. Right. Don't lie. Sure. To, especially to, to kids. Uh, Educate them, sure. and that's that's what it boils down to is it, is educating um, everyone on, sure. on what what these drugs, if you will, are. Right, but you um, know the number one rule of government, right? Fearful people are easy to manipulate. Right. Yeah. So, yes, there was the whole "this is your brain on drugs." Mm-hmm. Do I think that cannabis is a gateway drug? I don't. I think that 
there's so many mitigating factors for when people's addiction clicks in, mm -hmm. right? Because can you be addicted to alcohol? We absolutely know mm -hmm. that you can. Right. Can you be addicted to cigarettes? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Can you be addicted to sodas? Love. Yeah, love. <laughs> and food. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And drama. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's not that marijuana and any type of recreational adult use. It's that what are the other mitigating factors that would allow this person to then be succumbed and want to try mm -hmm. other stuff? Because there's lots of other things out there than marijuana that aren't going to make you addicted like heroin. Right. So there's, I just, I don't put a whole lot of stock in that. It just sounds like another, another tired, stale argument. Gotcha. Um, you know who's out on the market these days? I, I don't. Sarah Palin. Ah, oh. T Todd dumped her. Oh, yeah. Divorced her. Uh, what was it? Uh, inconceivable, uh, irreconcilable anger it's issues. Something. Or something. Well, no, actually, it's a, something I think it would, the gist was is that they don't, uh, they're not together enough to justify my Sure, so. sure, sure. Um, you know, as we're recording this, uh, it's Tuesday, September 10th. Yeah day before uh, a day that you know, goes down is one of the most uh, painful sure. days uh, in the history of our country. 9-11, uh, mm -hmm. 2001. Do you remember where you was, where you were, was, <laughs> where you were? Do I remember where I was? <laughs> I do. I do. I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, I was actually uh, in Louisville. Um, I've moved away a couple of times and always come back. Because like you said earlier, man, there's just something about this town. I love this town. I love the people in this town. All my life, yes, I've lived here. I and was actually born in London, Kentucky, but shortly after yeah, that. I Kentucky and by birth, yeah, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I was working at Kinko's, actually, on uh, Bardstown Road. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the early shift. So I went in. And I guess I had to be there about 7.45 or 8. And, you know, this is back in the day when people weren't, weren't PDFing. And right. email, you could email. Right, yeah. But it's really more for forwards. Mm -hmm. So we were all sitting there. And this customer came in. And she ordered something. And she said, did you hear that a plane flew into a building in New York? And we were like, what? You had not. That was how you heard it. Then. That's how we heard about it. So you didn't have any TVs or anything on it? To there was nothing, okay. nothing out on the floor, right? Because it was all production area. So, huh, okay. So then another customer came in and said, hey, did you guys hear the a plane? And we thought that it was a, a tour guide plane, you know, yeah. and, and somebody just, how, how the hell are you going to yeah. hit a building, yeah. you know, type thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the manager at the time went into her office and she had probably a nine inch old TV and uh, plugged it in it was sitting on the counter and we were getting updates mm -hmm. and we were all standing there just kind of you know working and talking to customers the tv's on and you see the second plane hit the building so you uh, you did get to see the we second plane. saw the second plane <clears throat> and that was just like no, no accident here completely yeah. mind-blowing mm -hmm. right because it was such a big plane mm -hmm. so then we, you know, people came out, you know, th you know people are still working and, and dropping stuff off and picking stuff up. And there was a very somber note, you know, in, in everybody's demeanor that day. Mm -hmm. And the thing that struck me the most was how quiet everything was, right? Because the FAA grounded all air travel. Right, yeah. There was no planes in the air, mm -hmm. right? So the silence of not hearing a jet overhead <coughs> or a takeoff or mm -hmm. whatever. It's crickets, then. <laughs> crickets right. right and then uh the other chilling thing was watching the footage right because the internet was around mm -hmm. there was news being reported right. but your bandwidth was limited mm -hmm. and it was more of snippets you know like right. small video edits and stuff like that but then you watch the news and to hear the fireman's alert mm -hmm. when they stop moving when mm -hmm. their alert goes off and to hear that, just, 
that was the most bone chilling thing mm. I think that I can remember yeah. from that day yeah. is just to know that there were so many bodies in that rubble. It just, yeah. I, I, I'll share my, my story real quick. Um, I was working for Papa John's corporate office at that time and I would, when I just get getting into work and I, uh, I come in and I'm hearing all this chatter in the first plane that hit and for, you know, for us, we had conference rooms with TVs sure. and, uh, so we, everybody's running to find the TV news or whatever. We got to see the second plane hit mm-hmm. and I just, I remember, I mean, Literally, people are crying. Mm-hmm. People don't understand mm-hmm. what the fuck has just happened to sure. us. There. Sure. And uh, I remember we got to leave work early. Um, they sh- shut shut work down. And um, um, going home, I mean, it's, it was a school day. You know, mm-hmm. kid, you know kids were, cause I had young kids at 2001, young kids. I just remember my son who... Uh, was four at that time. Um, we were at the kitchen table and we had, uh, I still remember we ordered, we, I brought, uh, I'd ordered pop, we had pizza. And he clearly, he was bothered. And mm-hmm. he, I remember he's, he's a mama's boy too. And he just went and got on his mom's lap and he's sobbing. Mm. And actually, I, I get a little emotional over this, but his concern was he was scared sure genuinely scared that we were under attack that, right you know that he, you know, he was you know he's hearing kids sure. are hearing people are dying yeah. so you know they're flying planes into buildings you know he's you know they're looking over their heads thinking sure. you know what's ahead in our way right are they are, are, are the planes coming and are we being invaded God, now yeah. sure i was fucking sick over sure. that and, sure. and pissed sure. you know that you know, we were succumbing I mean we just you know how how could that have happened yeah. to to us yeah. and uh, and then yeah. you know since then you've heard the uh, conspiracies and oh yeah this building and that building going down at certain ways and, sure uh, and all the yeah it was I have inside job stuff I have to ask was it an inside job my honest answer is, I don't care. Okay, fair enough. My honest answer is because. Whoa, whoa, whoa I, I, no, I'm I, gonna challenge you there. I, well, then what, that's that's that that would be an easy. Why do you not care? You gotta explain I, that. I don't care today, and this is my honest answer today. Okay. I don't care today because I've had to unsubscribe to the majority of any conspiracy theories that used to float around and we used to have fun with because it's not fun to have that 3,000 people died. I'm not saying that at all. Yeah, I got you. I'm saying that we used to bat around conspiracy theories like they were ah, alternate facts. Well, maybe it's a little true or maybe it's not. We're living in such a off the rails political time that <laughs> you think <laughs> the political theater is so over the top Good God, yeah. and, and, and all of the red herrings thrown out by this administration just to fuel the outrage fan while they, while they quietly stock the bench, mm-hmm. right? 140 judges have been put in by the Trump administration. It's a lifetime appointment. Mm-hmm. So while we're mad about Sharpies, Right deflect and they're stocking the bench so that's why i say it doesn't matter whether it was an inside job of course it matters i don't subscribe to that it was an inside job because i don't think that we live in a truman show i don't think that there is ultimately this one governmental power that's pulling the strings on eh, it We'll go back. Well, hold on. Uh, I'm going to take the conspiracy level or to another level. Remember when Eisenhower left office? Mm-hmm. Remember what he said? His little speech to the to the nation. About the uh, industrial complex, the uh, military industrial yeah. complex. Uh, the the sure. military within the military. Sure. I mean, and who, 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 prop, who made their chunk of change off this 
the the backlash or the the not or not the back the reaction to nine eleven. So sure. we went in and invaded a country that we did on on faulty information. Not fault, yeah, right. So, but people, the thing that the reason why is be, that that I'm not that concerned about it. I don't think that it was a conspiracy. Okay, but I think that people always profit off of war. Oh, clearly, and so. If if the goal of 9-11 being an inside job was kill a set amount of Americans to have the federal government fund a trillion or ten trillion dollar war. That's a fucking sick. That's, yeah. <laughs> y- y- yeah, you know, and, and I think that in our day and age, right? But can you honestly say that at even probably people at that level with that much power who stand to gain that much money you know to sacrifice to them a few for the bigger sure for the yeah i there's always money to be made in times of war right but i think that in our current day and age billion and trillion gets thrown around a little much right so (coughs) well um, right before 9 11 do you remember rumsfeld it was it was shortly before 9 11 he, uh, in an inter- to the press or whoever it was, acknowledged that they could not account. They cannot at that time. Could they could not account for twenty or some amount of trillions of dollars? Sure. Trillions. Yeah. I, <laughs> yes. Yes. And 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 and, and the deficit's bad. So, sounds like X Files to me. Right. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. But remember, you know, for the people that freak out over the national debt, they can, they could write a check. They could balance the books and write a check. Twenty-one trillion, they could write a check, sure. and and still have tens of trillions in reserve, mm-hmm. right? But you don't run, and that's one of the things about our current administration that drives me crazy is that you don't run the federal government like a business. Right. You don't run fiat currency governments like a business. Mm-hmm. So that that whole he's a businessman, nah, that doesn't hold water with me anymore. Right. But I think that, you know, getting back, so a million seconds is 11 days, right? A billion seconds is 31. 31 days. Right? 31,000 days. Oh, 31. Oh, billion, yeah. 31,000. 31,000? Again, I'm not I'm not a math major, okay. right? But a trillion seconds is like 31 billion days. It, 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 it's just an absolutely unbelievably huge number, okay. right? And, and I just I don't think that there's this cable of government secrecy type stuff. Although I will say my caveat is this. Uh, my favorite graphic novel touches on this, and so you might enjoy checking out Planetary. Planetary is one of the best graphic novels. It's the most interesting that I've read, and I've read quite a few, but they do talk about a government within a government where mm-hmm. there's there are superheroes, but not. There are more people that just have these abilities. Mr. Snow, drummer. Mm-hmm. So check it out. Okay, cool. Planetary. You know, staying with that conspiracy theory, I'm, I'm one of my other projects I'm starting is um, a UFO podcast. And, okay. Uh, in, in the UFO f- um, field or in the people who are into the whole UFO conspiracy alien theory and all this, you know, something that has been uh, mentioned in the last few years is a planned a fake alien invasion ah which they give this because of the technology we have we could put shit in the skies and it looks like it's out of this world sure and then the military becomes gets all this power and jurisdiction and stay tuned for that in case you, you know, yeah. see some yeah I think that that it's always interesting you know for me uh I never had a problem with aliens. Are we the only ones here? Well, if we're not, 
as Sagan said, it's an awfully big waste of space. Mm -hmm. So what I like from kind of a conspiracy theory, alternate theory type thing would be uh, the idea of the multiverse. So that's kind of what planetary touches on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that we live, that reality is a, is a snowflake right. with 196,000 different facets, mm -hmm. which could be pocket universes, which could be alternate realities that look very much like this, mm -hmm. but they actually oscillate or vibrate at a different right. thing. So Where you're on the other side of the mic. Right. You're interviewing me. Right. <laughs> dum, dum, dum. It's your podcast. <laughs> right. But you know that, that there's these that you could uh, slip in between phases mm -hmm. of reality right. and that reality is not just four dimensions it's 32 or 196,000 or something um, you know with um, just and I'll leave it says, with the, the UFO thing you know the government you know, or the Air Force has recently released some video footage of the Know that those radar videos. Oh yeah, yeah. Have you, have you seen those? The, yeah. Is this the, the, the snake tack and the, the tic tac yeah. and the triangle yeah, and so all that? Yeah. Stay tuned. You know. You know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know, a lot of that's probably just skunk works. Don't be a buzz killer. No, 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 no. <laughs> skunk works is is still doing amazing stuff. Okay. You know, that's the. Uh, the, the subdivision of the... Oh, yeah. no, we want aliens. Oh, we want oh okay. Aliens. All right. All right. Uh, Naruto run, yeah. September 21st. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> As we... Um, is, that, is that September 21st? It's coming it's up. 20, yeah. Yeah. The, I think it's the 21. Yeah. My favorite, my favorite meme <laughs> about all the Storm Area 51 was... Somebody yeah, saying that some, somebody in the military had to talk and tell a five-star, four-star general what a Naruto run was. Yeah. Oh, that God, was, that was pretty good. Well, what is kind of scary about that is that, uh, from all indications, there, there there will be people going. Yeah, it sounds like it. And there might be a handful to hundreds, thousands that might storm it. Right. You could see a bunch of dead people because that is a... They do have the, they've, they've they've the got, right. They have they, the right. They have the right to use, you know... Yeah, force to... Extreme yeah, force yeah, and so, deadly mm. force. Yeah. yeah, I think that... Uh, yeah, no. That's, they're not going to be uh, able to storm it. If, if, if honestly, if they make it more than a mile into Groom Lake, yeah. uh, I'd be surprised. I, that place has got to be so bugged and censored. I'm, I'm tuning in. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. yeah, grab your popcorn. All right, as I'm winding down the podcast with you, I, I do kind of a rapid fire uh, thing that sure. I call my little round of shots here. There you go. First concert you attended? First concert. Ooh. God, that's pretty good. Um, I would say... Oof, it would have been in... Yeah. You don't remember or you don't... I've been to a lot of live shows, yeah. so that's a good question. Um, I remember, I'll, I'll say my most favorite was there's a group in Tennessee uh, called Grand Torino. I've heard of it. That used to play uh, at the Casbah in Johnson City when mm -hmm. I was living there. Okay. So, yeah. Probably, probably one of your first ones. Maybe? That that would have been one of the first. Yeah, because I only went to one or two in high school. Mm -hmm. But, see, I didn't really listen to much music growing. I, I liked music, but there wasn't a whole bunch of music. It's when I got out of school yeah. that I embraced all the different genres gotcha. and styles. <coughs> if you were stuck in an elevator with a celebrity, who would it be? Who would you want it to be? Hmm. Yeah, these are good questions. Uh, right now, I would say um, Home Dude from It Too. Um, you got you went to that movie. Yeah, yeah. I liked it. Yeah. I, I, it's a little long, but uh, Bill Hader from that just absolutely shone through. So I enjoyed him. So I'd like to be uh, be talking to him for a little while. For a little while. Um, if you had a superpower, what would it be? Night hearing. Night hearing. It's an office joke. Office reference. From the off. The, <laughs> From the office, the, yeah. I saw, I've, I've not heard that. Night so, hearing. Night hearing. Yeah. Dogs Dogs know where I go when I point. And, um, <laughs> now, superhero, I would like, uh, I would like to be 
clued into the uh, atomic galaxy wide internet. Yeah, one of my favorite authors uh, has has really just what kind of a superpower is that? Uh, futurism. <laughs> Enough. Yeah, Carl Schroeder. Yeah, okay. it's the galactic wide internet. So you've got like Google Maps and everything mm-hmm. on different planets. Right. You can bring it up, history, all of these okay. are I'm things you over. So you gotcha. can check your email and send out distress calls, but you're you're on another planet. On another planet. Um, pet peeve. Tell me something that just irritates the hell out of you. Oof. Well, we're kind of at a weird time in history. So things burn kind of close. Um, You're not a fan of this administration. Not a fan of this administration, <laughs> federally or at the state level, I'm as, with it, you. as I'm it were. I'm totally with you. Um, I think the thing, I'll, 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 de- I'll demure to my graphic design background, the, the number one thing that I absolutely go rage eye over is when people use the font papyrus. The font papyrus. The started, font. Like a uh, font. font. Literally a font. I got to go look that one up. Okay. Yeah. You'll you'll know it when you see it because every yoga place and natural, it's it's a weathered font. So yeah. my, my idea behind the reason why people use this font is because they want to convey the message that their text is old and weathered like they've been here forever and had survived generations. When it actually, it sucks. <laughs> Enough so that I started a blog 15 years ago called, wait for it, Your Font Sucks. <laughs> and it only deals with papyrus. Do you still have that? I still oh, have I it. I want to say it. You yeah. gotta, it's give on me, Facebook. Give me that and I'm going to add this. Type, it, type your font sucks in there. Right. And I'll tell you, man, <laughs> it's, it's, it's gotten less now. And I'm not doing the, the logo design that I was back mm-hmm. in the day. But good gravy people use this thing all the time and and it's a lot of the natural healing arts right. that that tend to go after it because it looks like a weathered you know mm-hmm. you know font from a fairy pond or gotcha. something okay um tell me give me one thing on uh, on your bucket list that give me one thing that's on your bucket list one thing on the bucket list uh, I think that, ah, all right. Uh, I would love to be retired with my wife, Amy, and us get a overland or long haul camper, mm-hmm. which is a four by four, six by six, eight by eight, mm-hmm. drive anywhere right. type camper and, uh, drive across Europe. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's good. That would be cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. These last. Well, let me go up one more. If you had access to a time machine, it can go anywhere in the past to observe. Sure. Not to change the future or whatever. Sure. To observe. Where would you go? Ha. Ah, interesting. That's the same idea prefaced in the graphic novel or the, you know, planetary. Mm. Um, a lot of people would say they want to go back and see when the first time that a time machine, time machine was used. Uh, I would say... I would say I would probably like to go back to 1776 really? to America and just kind of see what it was like. Cause mm, I, that's interesting compared to now. <laughs> I think, I think modern Americans really have this rosy idea of what it was like to live in America. And you know, look, the federal government didn't give a crap who you were right. until the thirties, until the great depression. Yeah. They didn't, nobody cared. You didn't pay taxes. They didn't have to buy you anything. They didn't have to build you roads. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to maintain the roads, right? So we have this rosy idea as Americans that, oh, they were just down on the farm. Well, yeah, they were, and they had to work for their food and work for the livestock and be able to plant and sow and reap and survive the winter Mm -hmm. and dysentery and a cold would kill you. And middle age was really about 30 because yeah. you've made it to 60, then you're like, yeah. who are you? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think I'd like to yeah. go back to That's 1776, hang out in Philadelphia for a little while. Before the bell. Before the bell. <laughs> pre-bell yeah, with pre- Nick Cage. <laughs> Nick Cage. <laughs> All right. These last three, first two are yes or no. Okay. Last one, 
give me an answer in one sentence. Mm. First one, yes or no, is there a God? Ah, yes. Two, are we alone in the universe, which we kind of touched on? Absolutely not. Yeah. And three, what happens when we die? I think it's the same for you before you were born. Good answer. <laughs> that is a good answer. Yeah. Can't thank, yeah, thanks for hanging out with me. Man. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. I'll see you tomorrow. Sounds good. <laughs>